So hi everyone, today we're very, very lucky to be talking to Jeremy Howard. So Jeremy's a data science researcher and developer, um, probably most relevantly a successful entrepreneur. So recently Jeremy's founded um, the Fast AI, uh, which is a research institute dedicated to making deep learning more accessible. Um, it supports a few courses. It's really the connection to us is, it helps us uh, better secure, better pursue opportunities, be more successful in what we're doing. There's a lot to learn. Uh, a bit more on Jeremy. So went to school, obviously. That's great. School's great. Um, spent a lot of time working in both Australia and in Silicon Valley, San Francisco, the US. Um, founded and ran quite a few startups, which maybe you've already CV or maybe he wants to tell you about them, but there's no real need for me to list them all out. Um, I think the relevant thing, or really relevant thing, is mentored and advised many, many startups. So I think that's particularly interesting for us when we're looking for possible things we could do different to be more investable. Um, and he's also spent quite a fair bit of time, or eight years is a long time in my world, as a management consultant in big places like uh, McKinsey, which is probably relevant there again. So welcome, Jeremy. Thank you very, very much for making the time to talk to us. Appreciate it. Yeah, good day, Nathan. I'm actually joining you here from quarantine in Sydney. So pardon the uh, modest background, but literally haven't been allowed out of this room for the last two weeks. We're getting out tomorrow, so I'll be able to see the wide world again. That's good. So we've literally got someone who could help us and we've trapped them until they do help us. Yeah, good job. Cool. Um, so I just wanted to throw a, a few kind of talking prompts at you and then basically just sit back and give you the floor. How's that sound? That sounds fine. Just a request if you could turn your speaker down a little bit because I'm getting some feedback. Okay. So there we go. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. So um, the, the first thing, and I know maybe this is probably a little bit frictiony because you kind of know what you're doing, I kind of know what you do, but just for the sake of the general audience, um, really, how, how can someone starting up, how can someone just entering this game, how can our community use the kind of resources you guys do, what kind of resources, what's the, the best way we can engage? Sure. Um, so, um, as you mentioned, I'm a founding researcher at Fasted AI, and Fasted AI is all about making deep learning more accessible. Um, and uh, accessibility means removing obstacles, right? So there's a lot of obstacles, particularly when we started it in 2013, there are a lot of obstacles to using this really powerful tool. Um, it was hard to learn. Um, it was hard to find enough compute to run it. It was hard to find enough data to use it. Um, it was hard to program. Um, so we, um, so we created a, a bunch of educational materials, which we redo every year from scratch. Um, we uh, write software to make it easier to, to use deep learning. Yep. Um, we do uh, academic research around um, how do we make it, um, how do we remove constraints? How do we make it possible to use less data and less compute and so forth? Um, another critical thing we do is we provide a community. So, um, yeah, so uh, so Fast AI does these four things, right? So that was uh, the, the, the educational stuff, online courses, the software we write, the research into how to make, you know, remove barriers and, and the community. So, um, you know, it's th there's a strong uh, relationship between this and startups because a very high percentage of the people who use our software and take our course are either starting a startup or working in startups because obviously AI and deep learning in particular create a new lot of, lot of new opportunities that didn't necessarily exist before for, for, for new kinds of businesses or for businesses that do things different ways. So a lot of the folks in our community are very interested in learning about how do you go from an idea um, to something that you can sell <laughs> or get investors in or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the community is certainly an important part of that. Um, but in the end, you you need to actually know what you're doing. So the actual technical 
material, the, the educational material and the, the software libraries are a critical component. They're, they're all free. Um, so anybody can go to course.fast.ai and get started on deep learning for nothing. Um, and the, the critical thing about the way we do education is it's up down, which means that we, um, in lesson one, you're training an actual practical model that actually does something useful and does it really well at you know world-class standard. Um, lesson two, you're learning how to deploy that model and create a, an application, a web application around it. Lesson three, you're learning about issues around um, the things that can go wrong when you try to deploy your model, you know, and uh, including issues around ethics stuff as well. Um, and the whole thing, you know, you're coding all the time. So it's, it's very hands-on and practical. Um, obviously plenty of math comes up along the journey, but rather than saying, first you've got to do four years of linear algebra or something, we just say, okay, when there's some new math, we're going to teach it to you. And then we'll, we'll dive in. And sometimes we'll say like, oh, okay, we're going to assume that you pretty much remember what logarithms are and how they work. And if you don't, that's okay. Here's where you go to get, get rid of a refresher. I think I think it's really interesting, right? So I don't know if you've intentionally done it, but you've kind of touched in two things there. It's, it's almost like fast AI exists just to remove the friction that stops regular people from using a tool that they probably would want to use. It's right. just too hard to get into. Right. And then I also think within the box, you've painted out a couple of examples there of um, very pragmatic steps that go from idea to that is fit for purpose to that's how you get out the door. I think it's much uh, broader than, you know, uh, like I know your application space is deep learning, but I feel like those, those lessons are much bro uh, broader. Oh yeah, than, um, that particular for sure, topic. for sure. Um, so during the courses, we cover a lot of stuff, which is not particularly AI specific, um, particularly because um, the courses are all recorded live and there's an a live audience of about 3,000. So we're getting a lot of questions during them. Um, yeah. And often those are about issues around, you know, deployment and scaling and bootstrapping and, and stuff like that. And so really, we, uh, we think of this as being about um, building data products. So, and data products, they're not necessarily startups. They're things that could be new ideas within an organization, or they could be improving the kind of efficiency of some existing Thing that you're doing in an organization or, or it could be a startup um, and one of the things we focus on is the idea that actually building data products is not that different to building any kind of product you know um, and so like particularly in big companies we find often executives seem to turn off their brains when it comes to thinking about data products because they think they don't understand them and so they kind of like try to outsource them or they rely on like magic um, rather than thinking about like, well, what kind of reporting systems do you need in place? Where are the humans going to be in the loop? You know, uh, how are you going to roll it out in a way that's kind of gradual and low risk? Um, Real often we find particularly big companies are kind of like, oh, let's hire IBM Watson and they're going to magically transform our business. The problem. Yeah, which is that kind of magical thinking is very dangerous. Yeah, I find it, I find it interesting and in yeah, so in my experience, it's, it's almost two parallel streams. So yes, there needs to be tech depth to be able to solve the thing to actually achieve the thing. But the business rationale, the adoptability, the go-to-market, the deployment strategies, that's almost universal. So right, and, and the rationale, right. And, and But there are, like, there are distractions that can make it harder. So like the rationale, for example, a lot of people getting into deep learning, their rationale is like, oh, I just read this new paper, you know, or I just learned about this new technique and it's really tricky, it's really cool, I really like it. So I'm gonna do a startup about whatever, you know, about transformers or generative models or whatever. And I'm like, I always have to say like, that's not a startup, right? A startup is, you know, I wanna help this group of people do this thing, which they currently do in like this efficient, inefficient way, or this way yeah. that people hate, or this way that's too expensive, or they're not doing this at all because of this constraint. And that constraint can be solved with this tool. So this yeah. kind of like um, 
tools first driven rationale approach is yeah. an absolute nightmare. Thinking about tools is useful if it's like, okay, um, I'm going to help paralegals to identify, do due diligence. Uh, and it's a new opportunity because NLP classification has now improved to the point that we can automate this for the first time. And that's why there's now a startup opportunity there didn't used to be, for example. Okay. So you yep. start with the problem you're solving and then you jump to like, okay, the, there's technological advances that let us do this better. Therefore we can have a competitive advantage by doing it differently. Yep. But it's not like, oh, I want to use transformers to make a startup. <laughs> you know? yeah. So I particularly like, I don't know if I've shortened it, but I particularly like the fast AI tagline of making deep learning on core. I think I respond to it because maybe the people I hang out with like to play buzzword bingo a little bit too much and they like to make uh, solutions looking for problems. Mm. Um, is, that, is that the thinking that drives that tagline or have I misread it? Oh, yeah, it's certainly part of it. Um, you know, the... There's something more fundamental in that tagline though, which is being cool is like about being exclusive and uh, exclusivity is a problem. Um, so when we started Fast AI, you know, which is like 2013-ish, everybody doing deep learning at that point were basically uh, well off white men connected to a handful of exclusive universities. Um, yeah, so it sounds okay to me. <laughs> it's, it's not a problem for self and a lot of those people were our friends, but they, they were pretty disconnected from the real world of like what kind of problems do like normal people face. Um, and so they weren't working on those problems and they also didn't have access to data sets and uh, understand what constraints were you know involved in implementation and stuff like that. So yeah. we really, um, we really wanted to bring deep learning to like uh, people in medicine or law or journalism or you know people using Windows computers, uh, people in Africa, uh, people who you know whatever like people who were not currently. You you made after my own heart. You put Windows using a Windows computer next to living in a third world country. Yeah, totally. Well, as a, as a Windows user, I'm used to being, you know, treated as some kind of moron or leper or something. <laughs> um, but most of the world uses Windows computers <laughs> and we want to help most of the world. So that's I think, important. I think the interesting thing, like to be serious for a second, it's, a, it's actually a good example. Like times have moved on, things have changed. It is a piece of tech. It's an enabler. It's, it, it's not the reason to do something or not to be able to do something. It's just a, a screwdriver or a tool you might use along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you, you've kind of already drifted into this, but what, one of my main ponderings are, you know, is AI part of robotics? Is robotics part of AI? Does it even matter? You've kind of drifted into it with some thoughts, but do you want to play with that for a bit? Uh, look, I don't have any idea what AI is. Um, often I recognize it when I see it. Um, um, you know, it's, it's robotics. I mean, I find robotics extremely intimidating. Um, you know, it's only smart people like you who are able to get into this field. Like to me, you're well, dealing with why, like, why is that? you've got like sensors, you've got actuators, you've got route planning, you've got detection algorithms. It's like, I feel like you have to know a whole lot of really difficult things. Now, a lot of those really difficult things, um, uh, AI, you know, are considered in the purview of AI. So like obviously a lot of route planning algorithms are certainly considered AI. Object detection, you know, a lot of that stuff is nearly always done with deep learning nowadays. Um, yeah. uh, you know, on the other hand, a lot of stuff in robotics involve things like creating a good gripper you know, which is like going to be a bunch of material science and a bunch of kind of engineering and whatever. Yeah, so, so yeah, there's obviously a big overlap between between these yeah. things. And um, there's certainly people who are trying to solve some of the difficult problems in robotics using neural networks and are having some success. 
Yeah, I see, I see what you're pointing out as being a major challenge in robotics. It's really um, a team sport and that there, that, that there is no real solution, a stable solution in just one aspect. So, so maybe you might have a whole team of people making just one good finger to use for a gripper, but there's no company out there that just wants to buy a finger. There's, right. there's not even companies that want to buy a gripper. They want to buy the robot that's in the production line doing the thing. So right. that's three or four orders down. So you know, I find that interesting. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this is still the case, but I, I haven't really been in Australia for 10 years or so. Um, but when I was here, I did find Australia Australians were kind of like pretty specialized and insular, particularly in academia around like, what did they do? You know, it's like, oh, well, we work on this little joint of this finger and, you know, we optimize how, you know, how that actuator works. Um, Something I definitely noticed in the Bay Area is most people I was dealing with were kind of interested in solving the end-to-end -end problems around like, oh, how do I build a robot that does X or build an autonomous vehicle which does Y. Um, yeah, I'd love to see more of that kind of like integrated, bold, problem-solving so thinking need, in Australia. The needs focus, the problem-solution the problem solution focus versus the... Um, component focus. Yeah, and also just having the the gumption to believe that you can try and solve a problem that actually involves solving 50 sub-problems. I mean, I say that having just said that I, I personally don't have the gumption to try to solve robotics problems, but like I personally wouldn't get into robotics unless, unless I was solving an end-to-end -end problem, um, because I, to me that's much more significant than you know, making one kind part of, of one actuator better. Yeah, it kind of translates over into the market, right? So as soon as yeah, it's like why solve 0.1% of the problem 99% well rather than solve 99% of the problem 80% well. Yeah, I think that's a, that's probably a good point. So probably towards the end, I just I'm interested in what you what you see is the major points of friction to do uh, ventures here versus you know somewhere else. I'm particularly interested in your opinion, having worked in Australia for so long, as yeah. well as having startup companies, the, the most recent ones in San Fran. Yeah, well, I mean, my, look, my, it's all I can talk about is my experience, which, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, I, I found, I found going to SF very eye-opening and very confidence building. Um, so, um, growing up in Melbourne, doing my schooling in Melbourne, doing business in Melbourne, I always felt like um, an outsider and uh, kind of like a, a bit of a weirdo. Because um, like I, or a bit of a whinger even, because I'd always be like, oh, this, this could be done better. This, you know, we should fix that, you know. And so, you know, so I, I started some companies in Australia. And um, so, for example, I started a company called Fastmail, which was, I believe, the first email provider globally to provide like synchronized email, which is what we're all used to now on your mobile phone, on your computer, on your laptop, you see the same email. Hmm. Um, and then the nearly universal response I got from, from friends and colleagues was, why are you doing that? because Microsoft and Yahoo already provide email mm. and they're much bigger than you. So they'll win and draw loose. So why are you wasting your time, you know? Um, and so that kind of like, yeah, I don't know. That's this kind of like very common response that I found not just to my companies, but to a lot of stuff I was doing. It was very eye-opening going to San Francisco where if you say like, oh, I'm trying to do this thing that Google already does, but I reckon I can do it better. People's response is like, that's awesome. Tell me about how you're gonna do that. And oh, here's three other people that you should talk to who have tried similar parts. And here's somebody else I know of who tried to do something and had this problem. He could maybe tell you about that. And here's somebody who might be able to invest in it. And like, there's this kind of, it's not a naive sense of like everything's easy and it's all going to work, but it's definitely this kind of sense of like, okay, 
trying to solve difficult problems is difficult. And rather than telling you that, let's focus on like how we can help you and how we can, you know, sh share our successes and failures and, and so forth. And so I found that really a breath of fresh air. And so I come back from San Francisco now feeling like much more confident in myself that I feel like, okay, it's, it's all right to, it's good to actually recognize things that you think could be better. It's good to try to fix them. And it's, it's, it's okay to be arrogant enough to believe that you can do something better than Microsoft, you know? Yeah, yeah I, think it's, I think it's probably maybe an entrepreneurial spirit to shoot for the stars and be happy to fail, but still have made it a long, long way mm. uh, versus probably much simpler, they're better than me, so I'm not even gonna try. Yeah. No, absolutely. And the thing is, um, most people give up on that journey, you know, um, and you can't really fail as a startup until you run out of money or you give up. So you run out of money or you run out of patience. Um, so like that's the biggest difference I find between people who succeed and people who fail is kind of tenacity. Um, so like in, in the email world, I saw as I was building fast mail over like 10 year period, I saw people come and go all the time. And honestly, plenty of them had good ideas, um, mm. but they just didn't stick around. You know, they kind of start with all this enthusiasm and then difficult things happen, things go wrong. Um, yeah. And you just have to keep pushing through even when it seems like, you know, everything's screwed. <laughs> So, so on a final note, pull out your magic wand and if we were going to change a couple of things to help ourselves, um, what, what would you say we should think about? Um, I mean, a, 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 a stronger um, VC industry in Australia would certainly be good. Um, I'm not an expert in it, but I, I've, I've heard that maybe the taxation around options is making that difficult here, so that would be nice to fix. Yeah. Um, uh, the other thing, so that's kind of like bringing together money and people, problem solvers, entrepreneurs together. Yeah. The other thing I'd like to see is to bring industry and academia together more. Yeah. Um, definitely something I kind of got used to in San Francisco, which I'm reminded coming back here is not really true here is there's really great deep links between research and, and industry. And you just don't hear people talking about patents and shit like that in the in san francisco it's all just like okay like let's not focus on locking people out of our technology let's focus on like making it so good that everybody wants to use our technology yep. and if a thousand people trying to copy it that's great because we invented it we'll be the leaders and we'll have created this whole industry or else in australia i kind of find yeah people Tend to, this is 10 years ago, so maybe it's changed a bit. I don't know, but yeah. it's like people tend to be in their own groups. They kind of like try to patent and lock up things. They, they like be very secretive about things. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, academic institutions are often focused on like, how do we get money out of corporates rather than like, how do we partner with them to get our ideas commercialized? Um, so it's, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of seems like the, the question of how do we make money out of this and how do we keep that money all for ourselves seems to come first in Australia, where else I found it was more successful to focus on like, how do we all work together to build something great? It's interesting. So the abundance model versus the scarcity model, I think it's interesting. And I, I don't want to even go into which one's right or which one's wrong. I, I do understand how, if you're in a, a country like Australia that practices a scarcity model, how being an entrepreneur is difficult because you, you just do have a lot of people saying no. Okay. And it's kind of lonely, you know, yeah, um, which is, you know, be, being an entrepreneur should be fun and exciting. And um, I like how social it is in, in, in SF that there's lots of meetups and people are just really incredibly generous with it with their time and expertise. Um, now, I mean, obviously I wouldn't be here if I thought SF was 
perfect, you know, there's plenty of things that are wrong with it. But yeah, there's definitely some some stuff there I think we can learn from and that we can improve in Australia. Okay, that's really cool. I feel like I could probably speak to you for another 10 hours, but I feel like you've probably got other things to do. Right. Um, before we wrap up, do you, do you want to land on a note? Do you want to give it anything a, a point out or something like that? No, I'm all good. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Jeremy. You're welcome, Nathan. Very informative and um, I hope to see you soon. And just for the record, if anyone cares, I remember the past now. Awesome. See you, mate. Bye.